You're listening to the UKC Hunting Ops Podcast, celebrating hunting dog heritage, competition, and community. United Kennel Club has been the hunting dog sports home for coon hounds, beagles, retrievers, pointers, cur feist, and more for over 125 years. Welcome back, everyone, to the UKC Hunting Ops Podcast. This is Trevor Wade. I'm the Coon Hound Program Manager here at UKC, and I'm joined today by the Director of Hunting Ops, Alan Gingrich. How's it going, Alan? Doing very well today. How about you? Good, good. Got another episode, a good episode on tap for you guys today, but uh, I guess before we get into that, how's uh, how's everything going? Eh, good. Um, made it up north again, did a little quick little hunting trip, a little one-day trip up north with the dogs, and, yeah. and uh, that was good. Ran, ran good all day long, got about 13, 14 miles on them, called it good, and came back home. After that initial uh, big storm, that uh, winter snowstorm we had a couple of weeks ago, it's actually been pretty decent here yeah, lately. Yeah, Been able to hunt a little bit. and Yeah, how about you? Uh, pretty good. I've been uh, I've been doing more pup training the past past yeah. week more than anything. Just little Jolene, how's she coming along? Little Jolene, she, uh, she got to see her first live coon uh, the other night. I oh, showed yeah. her one, and uh, yeah. she liked it. Yeah. Uh, I cut it loose and she went and treated it, but she treated it silently. She just, uh, she found the tree, was up on the tree, but couldn't get her to bark. I, but she still, she turned eight, uh, eight months old here on the third. So, uh, she's still pretty young yet. So yeah. I don't know, maybe one that, uh, put her, put her back a little bit and I don't want to, I don't want to overdo it yeah. right off the bat, but I think she's, she's got the makings to make a good one. We'll see. <laughs> Yeah, fun. We got another uh, another good podcast here today. I think uh, if you guys listened to the last last week's episode, which was episode twenty eight, uh, we talked about beginners to the sport. Uh, we talked about first you getting a coon dog, getting into coon hunting, and then also once you're coon hunting some and you want to get into competing, uh, how do you do that and some ins and outs of that. So that's back in episode twenty eight. So be sure you go back and listen to that. And we got a little long winded on that episode, I think. We did a little bit. We had intended to uh, to add a little more to it, and we probably talked a little more than we needed to, or whatever. But hey, we made it. We're going to make it a two parter, so we're going to kind of finish that up today in this episode. So that's good. Plus, you added another little another little piece for today as well. Yeah. Well, this past week we've uh, we've kind of finalized where our world final location is going to be for the Coonhound World Championship. I know we've had people asking about that the past few weeks, and. Uh, we can now let it be known that the 2023 Coonhound World Championship is going to be at the Morrow County Fairgrounds in Mount Gilead, Ohio. Yeah, and that's a place we've been several times before in the past. Uh, this will be the fourth time we are there at Mount Gilead, Ohio. So, Yeah, hey, we we knew that, obviously, last year we were down in West Tennessee, Southwest Tennessee, and, uh, uh, you know, when that happens, we always want to bring it back to the heartland uh, for the next year. And I think Ohio is where we had our sights set since it was just in Indiana and Peru for a couple of years there in, in uh, 20 and 21. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we we uh, tried a few different places uh, and just had some ran into some trouble where there maybe the club didn't feel like they could do it or maybe there was a fairgrounds that wasn't available that weekend. Right. And uh, kind of just fell on Mount Gilead. They're a, they're a club that we we use for a lot of major events. Uh, they they host our TOC regions every year. Close to 300 dogs there this past year yeah. that hunted there, so they yeah. can surely handle this. Yeah, well, the, the last one that I was there was in 2018. That was uh, several years ago when we were there last, and they did a fantastic job. They can handle it. Uh, they were one of the first ones to put on that Thursday night dinner for all the hunters, and they, they did all that. And uh, uh, so— that's since become a staple of the it, event. It really has, you know, and uh, and UKC is now doing that, uh, and but they kind of started that, and that's just a good way to kick off an event. But not just that, they're also like they did that time. They are uh, uh, having some uh, fundraisers and, and things like that to uh, to help uh, help their guides. Yeah, you know, to pay for even for for guides, they're really putting a lot into this, you know, so. Yeah. Taking it serious, so that's all good. You talk about one of the top top states and or sorry, one of the top clubs in the country right. as far as putting on major right. events. Talk about they put on TOC regionals, close to three hundred dogs, but they also host. I went, I was there this year at Blue Tick Days in May. Uh, this next year, I'll be there in May for Black and Tan Days, which is a big event. And uh, and it, when you go to an event there, it shows it's a place that uh, has three things that you got to have to have a successful event. There's plenty of guides in the area. There's a lot of quality judges in the area, and there's lots of coons to be scored. Yeah. Yep. And they just have all, they meet, they check all the boxes over there, you know, and, 
And uh, they're not the only club that does that. You know, there's a lot of good clubs around the country, but they're one of the they're one of the better clubs in the country right now and can handle it. And I'm I'm looking forward to going back there again. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And like you said, this is the fourth time it's been in Mount Gilead. Uh, last time was 2018. That was back when Rackham Willie won it. J.R. Yeah. Gray he won yeah. the hunt. And the show winner that year was another familiar dog, uh, Midnight Brittle Bonner, hound. Connie Hogan. Yep, lot on there. So yeah, and that was a that was a good one. You know uh, what I remember remember a lot about that event, really. You know, but uh, one of them was uh, you know J.R. Gray, and he was you know everybody knows J.R. today, and a lot of it had to do because of that World Hunt. He won it with Willie there, you know, but uh, he was uh, he wasn't uh, uh, he wasn't that well known yet at the time. You know, good kid. Uh, and, and it just went to show, you know, somebody, uh, that, uh, you know, he wasn't a big time handler or anything like that can, can in fact win a world championship like that, just like he did. And, uh, look what it's done for him and that Willie dog. And then just on top of that, we now see how Willie is reproducing and this and that, and just a lot of good things. So yeah, night or, uh, 2018, uh, before that was 1999. So that was several years before I started working here. Uh, it was a treeing walker female that won that hunt uh, out of Maryland, a dog named Hillside Treeing Kate. Um, and the show winner that year was uh, Cherry Creek Banjo Rick. And that's uh, uh, Scott Houston owned that dog out of Ohio there and, and a well-known walker walker guy that had uh, had a lot of dogs, has had a lot of success. So, yeah, that was 1999, and then the year before, or the time before that, first time was 1988, when a a the only the only plot dog. the only plot hound that ever was to win it won it, and that's uh, Kansas Sizzling Heat. Uh, Jim Cannon was handling that dog uh, that year, and who is uh, unfortunately he, he passed away this last year. Jim did, but he was just a great guy, and uh, uh, but yeah, the only one to win world championship with a plot hound. And the show winner that year was a uh, treeing walker named Whitewater Ragin' Bear that was owned by Paul Phillips out of West Virginia. Yeah. So that's kind of the history there at uh, pretty, Mount Gilead. Pretty neat. Uh, one thing, if you got a plot dog, this might be the place to go. You talked about three years there, and two plot dogs were crowned world champion there. That's that's pretty neat there to think about. But, yeah, uh, for sure. So uh, finals are going to be in Mount Gilead, so we can talk about zone locations a little bit, I think. And uh, we're working on uh, finalizing an ad to get out there for our publications and online and all that good stuff. Uh, did some checking with some different cl uh, or with the clubs today. We were planning on bringing back all the same zone locations. Uh, I think for the most part we've done that. We still have a couple up in the air, but we'll kind of go over it here. Uh, zone one looking like it's going to be back in uh, southern Wisconsin, Brooklyn, Wisconsin. I talked to Ken Risley this morning. Uh, he's already had uh, discussions with the other clubs in that area, and they're pretty confident they're going to bring it back. He said 99% sure as of today. Uh, I can almost count them in, but uh, you. You never know till it, the ink is dry, but uh, pretty pretty confident in that one. Yep, and that's a good place too. Yeah, uh, zone two. This is a hundred percent. They finalized it today. Mercer, Pennsylvania, going to be back in Mercer, Pennsylvania. And I was talking to Nate Collins is our contact for that club, the Western PA club, which is actually in Parker, but they use the fairgrounds over in Mercer, uh, better for guides and just a better facility, I believe. But uh, talked to him today, and he's probably – they probably have the club that's going to be most affected by the change of final location when you go from West Tennessee up to Northern Ohio, which isn't very far from, from Mercer, Mercer, Pennsylvania. That'll mm -hmm. probably be a pretty big zone this year. Yeah, it should be. should be. Uh, and that's, uh, that's a great spot, too. Good, good hunting there around that area of Pennsylvania. Yeah. Uh, zone 3 will be back in Portland, Indiana. Just talked to Matt Lingo right before I came down, and they've already got their uh, site there uh, already – uh, scheduled and everything, and it's on the schedule. Portland, Indiana. Yeah, and that's three. always a good place, right there. And they'll 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 have a good entry there as well. Yeah, uh, Zone Four was in Palmyra, uh, Palmyra, Missouri, this past year. Uh, after that's talk the one that's still up in the yeah. air a little bit, isn't it? Yeah, he yeah. said there's they're fifty fifty right now on whether they'll be able to host it again this year. Uh, there's obviously some other good clubs around that area, so we can count on it being there within a couple hours of there, but we don't know 100% exactly sure where yet, so yeah. don't have a finalized location for you there. Yeah, well, hopefully they can make it work there. Yeah. be good to go back there again. Yeah, they did a great job. Right. Uh, Zone 5, Pilot Mountain, North Carolina, going to be back there at their club, uh, the Sora Town Coon Hunters Club. That one's locked in. Uh, Zone 6, just got off the phone with Jeremy Kastner a little bit ago, going back to Clarksville, Georgia, down there at the Habersham Club. Yep. Um, and Zone 7, Queen City, Texas. They're good to go, too. So yeah. 
Uh, six of the seven are pretty much locked in, just waiting on confirmation from one. And like I said, we still got a long time before the zones roll around. So we'll definitely have this information out there and in both the Coonhound bloodlines and then online for everybody to see. Yeah. You know, while we're talking on the topic of zones here, I know you don't have this in your notes, but I'm going to segue off a little bit of that. We, uh, we, uh, as most folks know, we use our field reps to serve as our officials for the zones and the world championship and all of our major events for that reason. But uh, we just this week uh, added another field rep, uh, Alan Roberts from Tennessee. So uh, Scraping the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the yeah, well, uh, hey, we're, of course, we're just kidding. Yeah. Good, He's a good guy. He's been a field rep before and was mm -hmm. for eight or ten years, I'm going to say. And he kind of he had young kids at the time. And his kids have grown up now, and, and we're tickled to have him on board. So Alan Roberts from 10 Mile, Tennessee, from your old stomping grounds, actually. That's right. Yeah, I, have a lot, I owe a lot of my uh, coon hunting, uh, all that I've accomplished uh, to him. He kind of a big mentor me coming yeah. up, and he helped yeah. a lot with a lot of the events I put on. And their club was just – it's it was the go-to club in the area. It says a lot about yeah. him because yeah. every it doesn't matter if it's a Friday night UKC event or if it's the zones for the world championship – He's going to be knocking on the bushes. He wants everybody there. He's going to have a few too many guides there. He's going to have too many judges there. Yeah. He's going to have a lot of food there. And yeah. and it's a big deal. Yeah. He puts a lot of effort into it. And that you see that go over to the to the to his field rep position, I believe. He's yeah. gonna he's gonna far exceed expectations for yeah, us. Yeah, he's just a, he's just a great guy. So I I look forward to working with him. So yeah, we'll probably see him at the world championship at one of the zones and possibly the finals as well. So yeah, uh, yeah it'll be good to have him. So what yeah, hey, not just that. So uh, we've uh, announced the location and the and the zones as well, but uh, just a couple other things. We have a couple of slight changes this year that are going to go into effect um, that I am tickled about. And, you know, obviously, we, the last episode we talked about the or episode twenty eight was it? Yes, that, that we talked about the full elimination event uh, rules. That would have been twenty seven. Twenty seven. So uh, in that uh, uh, that full elimination format is going to apply to here. Uh, but the one thing that is going to be a little bit different of uh, for the world championship, and hopefully we can dive into that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we the one of the first changes is going to be instead of taking 104 dogs from the zones to the finals, that number is going to change to 108. Go ahead and tell the folks why. Well, hey, after the world finals this year, we on our way home, we kind of were thinking about this and. And one thing that we've noticed the past couple of years, both at the world finals and the TOC finals, is that things just seem to go smoother with three dog casts. Uh, it's love, easier for the I judges. It's the easier for the three guides. Dog cast. Love that idea. Yeah. So we, we kind of brainstormed, how can we make it to where a bulk of the, the casts that are going to be at the world finals can be three dog casts. And uh, it, it kind of works out pretty good with just adding four dogs to an 108. So now in the first round, you're going to have 27, four dog casts. And that's right. going to be the only forecast dog you have all weekend, barring any uh, unexpected. Yep. Uh, dead cast or anything like that but then going into the second round uh, the second round early on friday going to be down to 27 dogs going to have nine three dog casts nine there. three dog casts first round on, or early on friday yep and then you're going to take those nine cast winners you're going to break them up late on friday and have three three dog casts yep and then that that'll leave you with a three dog final cast for yeah. saturday so I like that basically what it does it changed it be four dog casts in you know 27 in the first round after that rest of the hunt's going to be three dog cast and i i think folks are gonna like that yeah, though these are big high stake high leverage casts that these people are hunting in yeah uh, we want to make sure that they're safe that's one less dog to get out of pocket on you want to make sure that the judge is able to you know do their job as efficiently as possible if you have one less dog to worry about one less split tree to send a handler to that's all the better right yeah yep you know so uh and we're gonna also still have the top 20 just like we did before and, uh, uh, you know, we'll place them. Uh, we talked about in that full elimination episode where we talked about full elimination event rules. Uh, that's going to come into play here, you know, on Friday night early when we go to place the top 20. You talked about we should have 27 dogs uh, left. So seven of them obviously won't uh, will get knocked out, you know, not placing the top 20. Uh, but uh, second in cast will place uh, second in cast dogs on that early round, will place over third in cast dogs. And it's not going to be so much about score anymore, you know, how you place, you know. So that's going to be exciting. And uh, we're not going to go into a whole lot of it. Just encourage folks to go back out and check out or go back and check out that episode if you haven't listened to it, episode 27, you said. It's 26 or 27. Yeah. I wish I knew right offhand. But it's we're uh, talking about the full, full elimination, elimination format. Yeah, yeah, you and I talked about it in depth. 
Uh, the other thing that is going to be affected by this um, is uh, there is $25,000 that we pay at the World Championship, and we used to divvy that out to the top 10. Uh, so we made a slight adjustment because we're only going to have nine dogs in these uh, uh, semifinals uh, late Friday. We adjusted to those. That's where the money is going to get paid to the top nine. So if you make it to the late round on Friday, that's now you're in the money. So uh, before we had uh, first, second, and third is is going to stay the same. First is going to get ten thousand. Second will get thirty five hundred. Third will get twenty five hundred. And then fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh, uh, we paid fifteen hundred uh, in years past. And then eighth and or uh, uh, eighth and ninth and tenth uh, got a thousand. So we made a uh, an adjustment for tenth. We uh, uh, it took that thousand dollars there and added five hundred more to eighth and ninth. So technically, what that does, it gives fourth through ninth fifteen hundred each, which I think kind of works perfect. out. Yep, yeah, works everybody out. who loses in that semifinal round, you get fifteen hundred dollars yep. on top of whatever other prizes. And you it makes get. good sense. We're going to have nine dogs there, and that's the money round. So that's where they start getting paid. So it makes good sense there. So yeah, yeah, I I love these changes, and I can't wait to see them uh, see them in uh, in action here. So folks, get your dogs uh, qualified this year, and and uh, it's going to be a good year for the world championship. I feel like that's right. Really exciting stuff. The other thing is, you know, last year we had Ray Conrad just I'm button in there a no, little go bit, ahead. but yeah. uh, Ray Conrad provided lights for each one of the top 20. And uh, we've got that in his, we're contracted for the same thing again. So everybody, he's going to be on board and everybody in the top 20 is going to get a brand new hunting light from Bright Eyes. What's again. he called? The Bright Eyes Top 20 is what he labels yeah, it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, yeah. And that, that's on top of any other prizes we have, you know, of course, right. uh, Dollar Tree Pathfinder, though they're going to give. Pathfinder twos to the final cast, and obviously be some Yukonuba dog food there. And there's going to be a lot of good prizes yeah, for everybody stuff, at the World Championship. For sure. So, and we'll try to do it up like we did last year, and hopefully only make it bigger and better. You know, with all our live streaming and with these fully uh, elimination event rules, um, we can kind of make sure we have. Uh, that's going to be exciting. That's oh, just going to yeah. be good. Love it's, it. It's going to make for a way smoother event. Hopefully, we'll sleep better on those Thursday and Friday nights. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so we talked a lot about the hunt, but uh, uh, the four the bench show stuff is going to remain the same. But we do also have an announcement as about that as well. Uh, we're going to announce our bench show judges here today, um, and we got a couple of good ones, a couple of veterans in the sport, uh, well respected people. Our round one judge this coming year is going to be Mr. Mike Seats from Illinois. Yep, yep, and he'll be he'll be good. Yep. Last time I remember him judging a big show like this was probably 1997 in um, Alabama. Boy, as Alabama, he was one of the judges. Don. Hot that year, right? Yeah. I've heard you talk about that one It before. was him and Gene Hicks. I think Gene Hicks judged the finals. What and, a crew. Uh, yeah. So I remember it was like upper 90s that day. Yeah. And I believe uh, one of uh, Amy Smith won the show that day with a black and tan dog named Cowboy, I think it was. Very nice. So, yeah, I still remember a little bit of it. So, yeah. <laughs> it's impressive. Yeah. Uh, and uh, maybe uh, maybe you can get Mike Seats to clean up a little bit to judge this show. This time. Mike, you're going to have to wear your best suit out yeah. there. <laughs> It'll be a lot cooler inside the, yeah. the, the building at Mount Gilead than yeah. it was in Boaz that day. So he's going to judge the first round. Who you got for the final? For round two in the finals is going to be Miss Jackie Carpenter from Ohio, just right down the road from here. So. Yeah, she's been Excited kind of she's that. kind of been on deck for a, a long time. Judged a lot of shows, so glad it worked out for her to judge the finals here. So yeah, really she'll looking, love doing it. Looking forward to see yeah. how those two work. Uh, while we're on the topic, of course, we w the past couple of weeks, you guys have probably already seen it at this point. We've also announced our judges for both the Winter Classic and Autumn Oaks, and I figure we might as well give them a shout out on here while we're yeah, on the topic for sure. Uh, Winter Classic coming up soon here in early early February, and those have been announced. Uh, Mr. Rodney Bergbauer is going to be judging champions, grand champions, and be on the panel for the top ten on Friday night. Yeah. Uh, his wife, Mary Berg Bauer, is going to be uh, judging registered in pairs on Friday, and the top ten panel. I'll be on the top ten panel late on Friday night evening and then uh the third member of the top 10 panel is going to be Catherine baxter from right there right down the road in mississippi that's her winter classic and then in autumn oaks we got a a couple west virginians uh to judge that miss danielle champ and eric brooks are going to be judging that one eric's actually from virginia oh sorry about that <laughs> <laughs> yeah but uh yeah i think we we uh we kind of finalized these in the past few weeks and man i'm excited we got a good group of judges this year i think it's gonna make for some top quality bench shows
Alan, we both had Dr. Pathfinder 2s now for a little while. What do you think about yours? I'm liking mine. One of the things I had the opportunity to now download a map of an area where I did not have service, and I've used it there, and it has worked flawlessly. I love it. Yeah, I love the crystal clear maps. I love that I never lose reception on my dog's collars anymore. Highly recommended by me as well. Dogtra Pathfinder 2, the official GPS collar partner of UKC. All right, now it's time to get back to, to our two-part segment, talking about some, uh, some beginners in the, in the way they do it. And the first thing we're going to talk about is people, now, now you're, you're into competition hunting, you've been competing for a while now, but now it's time to start judging casts. Uh, which is a big jump for anyone. And I think that once you're competing at the at the local level and uh, the officials there in the club, they see you, uh, you're going out on cash, you're not having any issues, um, you're, you have a positive attitude, they never have any trouble out of you, that's whenever they're going to start approaching you about, hey, well, how do you feel about judging in these casts? And that's a big step. Yeah, it is. You know, and uh, the the one thing is when you're when you're newer, uh, the first couple times of judging is going to be like any anything else that you do for the first time. It's going to be maybe it, and it depends a little bit on the person. Uh, but um, uh, when they ask you and you feel comfortable with it, uh, take it on. You know, yeah. t- take it on. You know, and if you don't, if you absolutely do not feel comfortable, then don't. You know, right. and uh, you need to prepare yourself a little better before you do it that first time. That's perfectly fine. You know, but uh, if you are if you uh, feel comfortable. And able and uh, and feel you have the have acquired the knowledge to to do that way. Absolutely, yeah. Take the bull by the horns and get with it. <laughs> it, it is a, it is a big step, and it, it can is. be a little it overwhelming is. your first time sure. when you realize I'm not just responsible for this doll, but I'm responsible for the entire cast. And I think we both had kind of uh, similar situations. I think in our first cast that we ever judged, or the first few. I remember I hadn't been comp- competition hunting very long at all. Whenever I was at a local level event, they were looking for one more judge, and I got uh, recommended by by one of the the older guys in the club. He he can judge it, and I, I of course went and did it. And it was uh, I was uncomfortable, and it was it was tough, but we made it through. Yeah, yeah. You know, and if you if you if you're not comfortable at all, or if you're too uncomfortable doing it, then it can. Uh, I would never want to put that on to somebody that I feel is too uncomfortable and just not ready yet or what have you, uh, because that's perfectly fine. Right. Because uh, you can you can you can discourage that person pretty yeah. quick, you yeah. know, if they're just absolutely not comfortable. And really depends a little bit on the person as well. Absolutely, you know? it does. Uh, you know, yeah. I have. Uh, I'll just uh, uh, insert this little uh, thing in, and I have been t- and I have seen it to where. They, uh, uh, and this has been years ago when they assigned a judge, uh, waited to assign judges until casts were drawn. And this, so this has been a good number of years ago and something that does not work. Right. They selected a younger kid who's hardly ever judged before because of the other two guys that were in the cast. They felt like the only way that he had a fighting chance is to get him to give him the card. <clears throat> Wrong answer guess who the first cast was back in with right. questions and this kid was done yeah that's a good way to never get that yeah. kid to come back uh, it was just absolutely the wrong thing to do don't right. you know that's that's not what it should be you know but uh hey a good place to practice we talked about club hunts and things like that you know or practicing with your buddies same thing here with judging practice that yeah practice that you can learn a lot of subtleties about ju- uh, judging by getting out there and doing practice runs with people and yep. th- just a couple of ways that i put it here is you know uh, learning to keep times on a stopwatch. That's yep. something you don't think about if you're just out pleasure hunting a lot. But once you get into the into the set mindset, you got to start the clock when someone trees their dog, figure out how long three minutes feels, figure out how long eight minutes feels. It can change. Yep. And sometimes you're running multiple clocks at one time, you know, and sometimes you have to, for me, uh, there's on the scorecard, you have that little note keeping box there. Yep. I use that a lot when I judge. Just make my little personal notes, you know, may, it might be a time thing. Or what have you, just, uh, you know, uh, you can use that for sure. That's what it's uh, there for. You, another bullet point you made, learn how or learn how to fill out the scorecard properly. That's a that's a good one. You know, you want to fill it out uh, properly because uh, when I turn in or when you bring a scorecard to me as the official, I should be able to look at it and I should be able to tell basically what happened in this hunt, how things, uh, how things, uh, uh, turn out, you know, right. and how everything happened. And if you don't have that scorecard filled out, it can be a mess. Exactly. I can't, if I can't tell 
what all happened in this hunt, you probably didn't fill the scorecard out correctly. But so learn how to do that. That's I a good think one. I think one of the hardest transitions was for, for me was going from uh, I know I know the ins and outs of my dogs. I know what his barks mm -hmm. mean. But now I have three other dogs to to listen to and pay attention, and also handlers who are calling and and asking questions about time and different things. And it can be hard to kind of multitask that if you're not used to that. It is, and that's probably the the hardest thing right there. And try to keep everything together. You know, if you sometimes you can have a lot going on, you know, but uh, but also don't be uh, don't be you know. Uh, well, it's important to note that all of us have judged a first cast. Absolutely, and Absolutely. all of us have made made mistakes in it. Just yeah. uh, getting yeah. out there and, and practicing is, and, and is it's the best way. And to it's do okay it. to make a mistake. You know, right. some, if you're in that position, know that it's all right. You are the judge. You are in charge of the cast, and you have to make decisions. Just not sometimes, uh, not just not doing anything when you should be making a call or making a decision is probably not going to fare well for you. Right. And sometimes I always say you're better served when you got to make a decision, make a decision, whether it's right or wrong. We have the, we have the rules will, will help you in that if somebody doesn't agree with it, or if it was wrong, um, the cast mates can question it and that should never be a bad thing either. No. You know, that's a right that they have. And there's a reason for that. And then don't take offense to it if somebody questions a call that you made, but allow that procedure to, to work out the way it should. And sometimes when you're asked to make a difficult ruling or uh, a, a call, go ahead and make it, even if it's difficult. And maybe you might not even know for sure. Make it, and then they can follow the procedure to correct it if it was the wrong call. Yeah, that's funny. And my don't, next, don't my get, next bullet point there, familiarize, yeah. familiarize yourself with the question and procedures. I can tell you the one thing is never going to work very well or does not work that well if you stand there and try to hash it out with the rest of the cast right. that because nobody's going to, if it's a, if it's a tough call, chances are not everybody's going to agree with, it, and all you're doing is just making it even more difficult. Right. You are the judge, you make the call. Uh, another thing that can be hard for, for first time judges or, or novice judges can be, all right, I'm really familiar with the rule book. I know the ins and outs of the rule book, but now real life situations are happening and we have to apply the rule book to these real life yeah. situations. Yeah. That can be a big step, and that's when it comes in handy to really practice. You know, you're hunting with your buddy. You get there. You guys have been uh, having a little uh, a little hunt yep. uh, between each other, yep. and uh, you get in there, and there's a dog tree in but not declared tree. Yeah. How do I apply the situation in the rule book to the situation that we're in in the yeah. woods now? Yeah, and sometimes you the last bullet point you uh, note here, build confidence, and just doing it, you know, that will build your confidence, you know, and you're going to run into different situations. You're going to be doing it for a long time and have things come up that never happened before. But, uh, and, and that, that happens, but, uh, I like the next one here, the next section, some common mistakes that you can make. Right. And these, these are kind of, uh, abroad and there's obviously there's a bunch of them, but these are uh, mistakes that we would see more from beginners than someone, uh, not necessarily rule mistakes that we see, but just uh, general mistakes that we may see from somebody judging. Uh, the first one is uh, being too lenient with the cast, wanting to be everybody's friend in the cast, which is something that you talked about a second ago, I think. Never works very well. Yeah. There's a difference, I think, between being respectful, which we encourage all our judges to be respectful to the other hunters and the hunters to be respectful to the judges. That's very important to have a smooth cast. But being respectful and then being lenient to the point of the causing issues are two different things because people are going to take advantage That's out right. there if good they're point. able to. That's a good point, right? For sure. Uh, the second thing there that I have, and I hear this a lot, and it kind of it'll kind of make you cringe if you're the one putting on an event or handing out scorecards at an event, is don't ever concede that you're underqualified to the people in your you, that you think you're underqualified to the people in your cast. I've only judged a handful of these things, you know, we're all, I got the card, but we're all judging this tonight. Wrong. Yeah. If Wrong. You, if that's how you feel and you're, you're uncomfortable doing it, don't concede that you're uh, underqualified. Take it to the master of hounds or the event official and uh, get someone on the card who, who is comfortable judging. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's uh, that's one thing that we, we certainly hate to hear. And I cringe when I hear that, Hey, we're all judges because we're not. No, it doesn't, it never works well that way. And that's uh it's a good thing to to keep in mind when you're handed that scorecard. You are the one in charge, and and uh, and yeah, make those calls and uh, and then stick with them. And that that leads us into our next point, uh, being what I would call wishy washy on a decision, back yep. and forth. Mm -hmm. uh, like you talked about earlier, it's important make your call, stick by that call, and let the rules or procedures play themselves out. If there's any questions in the woods, they they'll uh, get it sorted out back at the clubhouse if need be. You're right. 
Yep. And if, like you mentioned here, if a person disagrees, that's totally fine. That's why there's a questioning procedure in place, you know? Yeah, I, I just want to being a being a judge is a big deal, um, and quality, trustworthy judges are, are the backbone of any major event. We talk about that all the time. Uh, you can't have uh, we can't have successful tournament champions or Autumn Oaks or World or Winter Classic without having top quality judges. And to be able to do that is an advantage for you. Uh, it means that you're well respected in the sport. It means that you you know your rules and when to apply them and how to apply them. Uh, you're kind of cool under pressure and being able to handle situations as they as they develop, and it's it's an invaluable tool to have in your in your repertoire, I guess. Yeah, it is for sure. You know, and uh, the one thing I would always suggest, you know, is, is take pride in being selected that you were selected. You know, that means somebody thinks highly of you that you're capable of it, and uh, and then uh, and then go and and do the job the best that you can. You know, and. Uh, you know, the one other thing that I'll add is, and we don't see it as much anymore, but we still see it a little bit sometimes, and, and, and I will say it here, is a, one, of the pet, one of my pet peeves is somebody that comes up, hey, I can judge, I can judge. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Yeah. Let the administrators yeah. uh, select their judges. You know, and they'll select who they feel, uh, you know, I don't know, for me, Somebody is just, uh, you know, really, really wanting to judge. Uh, it's kind of a little red flag for me sometimes, yeah. you know, and, and I don't know, just for me. I'm thinking back know. to some situations, maybe at like Autumn <laughs> Oaks where uh, during confirmations, one of the, yeah. the ladies in our yeah. department maybe yeah. have a note on the on the card. This guy really wants to judge. Like, well, we're not yeah. going to use him. So yeah. we'll use somebody yeah. else. That may be a reason we don't use you. Yeah. Because, uh, yeah. Yeah. Let uh, kind of let your name and your reputation speak for itself. You know, and you said there is an advantage to be a, to being a good judge, and that means that things are going to get uh, judged correctly. But there's also a little bit of a dis disadvantage, and the disadvantage you have is what you mentioned. You know, not only do you have to listen to your own dog, you got to listen to everybody else's dog. You got a lot more going on, you know. So that is that is the disadvantage you're at. But uh, we do need uh, good judges to step up, and then there's judges that have done it for a, a good while, and 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 most will uh it becomes a, a second nature and it's not even that big of a deal they can handle all those things yeah and one last note here that we talked about is uh whenever we assign a really top judge that we know that's a top judge and maybe he come to automos he doesn't feel like judging that weekend he or she doesn't feel like judging that weekend and they turn down the card uh come up to the event official somebody else and they can, can someone else in this cast comfortable judging yeah i can judge Eh, sometimes that can that can lead to a less qualified yeah. person judging the cast and maybe a bad experience for you. Right. Uh, so I hate to put that pressure on anybody, but uh, sometimes uh, if if top quality judges are turning it down, then sometimes the next tier down can can cause for a for a less yeah. fun hunt. And you know, uh, uh, event officials they you know somebody has to, they have to select their judges and they and and. Every, every every event official or the administrators, the host clubs, they want their event to go off well. You know, so judges do play a big part in that, you know. So uh, uh, when you're asked, uh, like I said, take pride in it and that, uh, you know, that you were selected for uh, probably a good reason and um, and do the best that you can with it. And and if you can, if you absolutely don't feel comfortable with it, uh, then, uh, then, then let them know that you just can't, you know, and let them select somebody, let the officials select somebody else. You don't, uh, you know, by rule, you really haven't, the, uh, the cast does not have the authority just to pass the card around to whomever. Right. And, uh, I, I know this, we haven't talked, we talking all about hunt judges here. Um, we're not talking any about bench show judges at all, because that's a different, a different type of thing that actually requires a license can't just appoint someone to be a bench show judge without having a license. And there's a procedure to get the license. And I think me and you talked about it. This probably isn't the episode to talk about that. We're going to talk about getting your uh, bench show judge license and also your master of hounds license and being an event official uh, in a later episode and where we have a little more time to expound on that and really yeah. go into detail on that procedure. Yeah. You know, maybe one other thing about night hunt judges we get asked a, a little bit is, uh, is, is there an age limit? And for regular events, there is no age criteria. Uh, but when it comes to like the world championship and even RQEs, which is a part of the world championship, the judge has to be a minimum of 18 years old and have judged at least, what is it? Five or six casts. Yeah. 
So that there's there's those uh, criteria there for the world championship. Outside of that, it's just a matter of uh, uh, you know having the experience or being capable of doing so. And I love to see it when the young guys are out there with a the card in their hand. We'll be right back. Hey, Trevor, how about those wait times in the registration queue these days? Uh, that department's done an awesome job cutting down on call queue wait times, shortening the length of time between emails, and the chat feature is still a short, valuable option. And those those times have went down to nothing. Uh, these days, uh, there is hardly any wait time at all. Right. And you're able to get a hold of those departments from 8.30 a.m. to 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time now, Monday through Friday. One of the final steps you can take as a beginner, uh, you made the jump now, you're, you're competing in events, now you're judging at events, now you become a good judge, you become well-respected in the area, you may get elected as an event official, or uh, sorry, uh, an, official, an officer for a club. Yeah. Uh, this is something that uh, is kind of the next step, and there's a, there's a lot of clubs out there, a lot of new officers that we see every year, and uh, you know, if that happens, hey, congratulations to you. Yeah. You're now a, a key cog in, uh, in the Coonhound events in your, in your, in your area and in, as a whole. In uh, in making coon hunting grow, yeah. Well, that's something that all clubs need. You know, they need uh, leaders, uh, and it comes with the officers. You know, they're the leaders of the club, and you need good members, good leaders. But uh, yeah, um, and you know, if if you are in this sport, and you know, you go to a lot of these club events. You know, they like we've mentioned that they're the backbone of the sport. All these clubs are, and they're all struggling for help and need members and. And you're doing yourself and in, in the sport a lot of justice. You become a member of a club. Right. Become a member of a club. An active member. Yeah, an active member. There's one thing, yeah, just to be a, to, to be a member, but go help out a club. You know, it's, it's uh, we certainly appreciate, you know, when we go to a club and we get, uh, get to hunt, uh, you know, get to hunt our dogs and this and that, you know, and, and they use their guides to take our dogs out and this and that. Become a member of your local club and you do the same thing for those participants that come to your events. I actually got a call Monday morning. It's funny to talk. I'm not going to say this out here just for everybody to hear because I think it's important to say it and that we're going to use this platform to kind of be transparent. But got a call Monday morning from a person who attended an event uh, an hour away from their house. Um, so they get there. They're the only champion dog. The club has no no person available for to be a non-hunting guide, nobody available to be a non-hunting judge. So this individual had to call somebody to come, uh, come over there to them, get them, had to take them all the way back to their hunting spot an hour away. Uh, they, they hunt their cast, come all the way back an hour to turn in a scorecard, and that's part of a double header. Do you think they're going to do that again for a second round, or you think they're ever going to come back to your event again? Probably not, and who would? And who right. would? And and that's probably the a recipe for a disaster of a club that's not going to be very long. I don't know where where that was or whatever, but that just does not work. And that's why they need, clubs need uh, membership to help put on events and things like that. And and you know what? Uh, clubs that don't have that aren't able to put on events like that. Or if you have to go to that degree, you know, really, if you're sending, if you have to send somebody that far, uh, especially in in this region. Uh, where we're in, that's just not not gonna work, not gonna work. Yeah. So we kind of got off on a tangent yeah. there, but yeah. that, <laughs> sometimes you have to speak the truth on there. So yeah. hopefully somebody takes that to heart, and, yeah. and clubs will take that to heart, members will take that to the heart. And we have a lot of clubs still that do take uh, their events seriously, and and uh, uh, things have changed a whole lot, you know. But uh, if you're living in the area and and uh, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of things. You know, some guides claim they don't want to guide because of the guys they take. Uh, they're afraid they'll come back to their hunting spots. That's a different, that's a separate issue, you know, and that should be, uh, uh, that's, that's you know, uh, uh, that could be another topic yeah. too. That's totally disrespectful. Yeah. If you carry me to your hunting spots and next week I'm back there at your hunting spots, I'm a pretty much, a, that's a low life yeah. deal on on my part. Yeah. You know, and most people aren't like that, you know, so do you, but to use that as an excuse, uh, that's why I'm not going to help a club. Ah, let's find something better than that. An another point that it, same individual made on that phone call was talking about how um, some of the people in the area, you know, he, he, he runs a different club in the same area, uh, separate from this one. He's talking about how uh, when he calls around to talk about people coming to the, are you coming to the event? Well, no, all I got right now is a, a young dog, but this guy's a member of the club. 
okay, maybe you don't have something to enter into the hunt, but maybe that's not what he's asking. Maybe will you be there in case we need a guide or a mm-hmm. judge in that situation or just come be a part of the event. You're mm-hmm. a member of the club. Sometimes we don't need you just to enter. Sometimes we need some help. Maybe you take entries. Maybe yeah. you're helping in the kitchen. Yeah. Maybe you're doing different things like yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, but that's all important. But once uh, once you get an elected as official, we get a lot of, or sorry, elected officer of the club, we get a lot of calls from first-time officers at mm-hmm. clubs. And uh, the, the first thing I always ask, well, you just got elected. Did the, did the person you're taking their place, have they helped make that transition easy for you? Uh, kind of told you the ins and outs of it. And hopefully, even if you get voted out or maybe you step down, you still take some time to talk to those newly elected officers about uh, kind of what you're doing for the club and how you correspond with different registries and uh, getting your permits and how the whole process works. Don't just make them come in with a a blank slate, no information, and just throw them to the wolves. Yeah. Yeah, and we have clubs that do a really good job of of that, you know, uh, helping those in the transition and this and that, you know, and it's really not that difficult. But there are some things for those that don't really know that have that that we have a lot of folks that have participated at events for a long time, have never uh, been an officer of a club and, you know, just take everything for granted, you know, and and uh, 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 need to need to learn some of those things, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and one of the one of the most important things to do right off the bat is to to update the officer list that we have on file here at UKC. Uh, the way our our rules are set up is that you have to be an elected officer that's on file here at UKC in order to make any changes as far as scheduling events, confirming events. Where do you want something mailed? Those changes have to be done in writing. That way, we can file it away in your club file and be able to refer to it if anything were to right. pop up in the right. future about inconsistencies and stuff like that. Um, and also, we want to update where the uh, where the packets are getting sent, where the confirmation forms are getting sent. All that's important. So the sooner that you can do that, the better. So you can get in touch with us. We can get that form to you either by email or by mail. And then also it's available on our website. So you don't even have to get in touch with us. You can print that thing off or even I think it's a fillable PDF. You can type in your information, it save is. it, and email it, it straight to our department right. and get it done in five minutes. Mm-hmm. It's a really easy process. Yeah, and that's something that we really, really, really need here at the UKC is to keep your officers up to date. We keep all that on, on record in our systems, in our computer systems. And then the next big thing is, of course, scheduling events. Um that's what what you have a club for in most yeah. cases. You know, events on your schedule. A little bit about the details of that. Each club is allowed to have seven event dates a year, uh, as long as they don't have any marks against them or where we've uh, limited their events that they're having per year, uh, for whatever reason. Um, and those dates, once you hold them this year, say you held seven event dates in 2022, those dates that you held are going to carry over into 2023 and be tentatively scheduled for 2023. They're they're reserved, you know, and, and that's when new officers come in sometimes. They think that don't really know and they didn't get much uh, help, you know, in, during this transition. They think, OK, we have these dates reserved. That doesn't mean they're just going to automatically happen. Right. They still have to confirm them, which I'm assuming you're going to talk about that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, that's the kind of next thing. Like you said, those are held on your schedule for next year. That means that nobody in your area can pick up – within 100 miles, you can pick up that date or within your conflict file can pick up that date. Right. Uh, which could vary uh, depending on your area or situation. But uh, then they're, they're scheduled, but they're not confirmed as what That's our different language that we use in our department. Right. There's a difference between it being held on your schedule and then you confirming it. And basically when we say confirmed, we're talking about you giving us the event details that we need. Uh, entry deadlines for your events, your entry fees, how long you're hunting for, is this thing, is it a, a standard event? Is it a poor boy? Is it a sectional? Is there any special details that need to be in here? And that's when we consider it confirmed, and that's when it goes on our events calendar. It goes on the events calendar, and if it's done in time, uh, it will also go in the magazine and upcoming events listing in the publication. Yeah, most people are used to the way that UKC used to be. Uh, I'm not sure when the change was made, but you used to have to confirm your date over two months out because if it wasn't in the magazine, you weren't holding that event. Didn't date. happen. Now, now we do as long as it's on the website, it can happen, but there's still a limited number of time, which is 30 days before the event date. It we won't confirm anything after that. Right. Right. Uh, another good thing is if a club is unsure uh, whether their a, a date has been confirmed. Uh, go search on our events calendar on the website. If it shows up there, that means it is confirmed. Yeah. And I think it's always a good idea if you confirm an event to at least check that events calendar at some point, uh, maybe over a month out from your event, make sure all the details are on there correct because mistakes can be made. There For could sure. be some misinterpretations over the phone or maybe a, uh, something on the confirmation form that was mailed in. Double check everything on there. Make it make sure it's okay. 
not just a couple of days before the event, but check well in advance. That's a good point to make if you're a new officer. Yeah, that that happens too much. You know, wait till the day before and realize, oh, this isn't correct. You know, it's kind of late to make a lot of change or make many changes at that point. Back end of it yeah. is very important as well. Back is, end meaning after you've, you've had your hunt, your events or what have you, and doing the paperwork. Yeah. And that's not a, it's not hard either, but it's needs to be done. Something has to be done. And there's a right way and a wrong way to go about it. This is the time of year where it rears its head whenever we're getting here to the end of some of our different programs. Uh, top 10 bench show is over, but we're still waiting on a couple reports to trickle in, or uh, we're getting close to the end of the year for TOC and we're getting 20 yeah. calls a day from people checking their wins. Hey, where's this win at? Well, we haven't got the report in. Get your reports and money in a timely manner. Uh, there's people out there that paid money to have their to their entries. They came and competed at your event. They're supporting the club. Make sure that in turn you're getting those event reports and, and the money in, in a timely manner. It's just another part of being a reputable club, you know, and it really reflects on it. And that's a people thing, you know, and you sometimes it's oftentimes really that's one person, an officer's responsibility to take the paperwork, get it mailed off to the UKC office. And oftentimes the rest of the officers don't even know if that's not, if that didn't happen. Right. But if it becomes a problem, um, they'll probably, they're probably going to find out because if we can't, if if we, as in UKC, uh, if we don't have your report, we're going to send some letters and it, 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 if you're getting a call from you or I, from Trevor, (laughs) that probably means it's, it's kind of, it's in a, bad place yeah you know it's it's went too long and you and i don't find out about these issues until it's really become a problem oftentimes the uh, ladies in our department they've already sent a couple letters still no responses this and that and that's when there's a good chance we're we're not going to go to the corresponding officer we're probably going to contact the president and i'm sure you found out a lot of times they weren't even aware that there is an issue you know yeah. so uh but yeah, that's and you know uh, for those folks that uh, got their wins at your club, that's very important. And uh, hey, I have also been uh, uh, on that end of it, being a corresponding officer for the club and respond the person responsible for sending things in. And I know how it works. You take it home from the club, you put all the paperwork in your sun visor in your vehicle. Uh, you good chance it might still be there three weeks later and you simply forgot about it, <laughs> sure. you know, but yeah. be responsible and uh, get it out there. Get, yeah. uh, get things put together and, and get it in the mail. Yeah. One good thing about now that may have obviously way different than whenever you were doing it when you had to mail in the physical copy of the report is that now we have different avenues for clubs to take to make it even easier for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, you can still mail it in, which a lot of clubs will mail in their reports and their payment with a check or what have you. Uh, but now we're also giving clubs the option to they can they can fax in a report. Some people still do that uh, or uh taking a really clear picture or scanning is probably the preferred method and emailing them directly to the hunting ops department. And then you can get that thing knocked out in a couple of days and not even have to worry about it right. anymore. Scanning is what we would always encourage those, those individuals that have a, have a scanner and you can really, you can find a decent, you know, a cheap scanner that works very well, hook it up to a computer and scan documents like that to send in. That is the best and most efficient and easiest way uh, for uh, event reports like that. And I know some clubs that'll take it to the, to the city library yeah. and go do it that way. There's, yeah. there's ways to do it without even having to buy a scanner. Yeah. And the, like you that. know, with all the technology we have today, that's just, it's for somebody that is, uh, you know, a little tech savvy and it's not that hard, you know, that's, uh, almost a lot more convenient than putting things together and putting it in the mail. Oh, absolutely. Way more efficient. Uh, you, you can decrease the probability of it getting, uh, damaged or right. hurt somewhere along the road by right. doing it this that is, way. This is probably a good time. You know, the longer we go, we're doing more things electronically here and we'd encourage clubs, you know, that their corresponding officer does have or does have uh, is uh, able uh, to send things electronically and receive things because we're going to a lot more things like that. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and when you're, if you're doing, if you start emailing in your copies of your report, you may wonder how you're going to pay for it. And that's a question that we get quite a bit. And that's really simple. I'll, 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 most of the time, what they'll do is they'll email in copies of reports and just in the email body of the email, just let us know, hey, call me for payment. You can do it that way. Yep. Also, Lacey in our department, who's kind of started taking over, uh, do, dealing with these reports just recently, has made some updates to some of our uh, report forms, adding a section on there for credit card information where you can straight fill out the paperwork, add the credit card information on there and do yep. it that way and not even have to deal with us at all. 
Yeah, one bullet point you put on here that is very important. I like it is make sure the event report is filled out correctly. Just take the time to look it over before you send it off, whether you mail it or or scan it, you know, because uh, one of the uh, next one here is some common mistakes uh, that we find here uh, that I'm sure you're going to talk about a little bit. Yeah. So I, I got with Lacey and Morgan in, in our department. They do a bulk of the process and when it comes to paperwork coming in and uh, kind of got a uh, general idea of what are some of the most common mistakes you see. Because like you said, we don't uh, we don't oftentimes see the mistakes until they're at a very urgent level. Right. Uh, so they're dealing with a lot of the ticky tack mistakes from day to day. So the first one is the report not being completely filled out. Um, make sure you got your club name on there. Make sure you got your club ID. Corresponding officers of the club should know what that club ID is on all your confirmation forms and all that good stuff. Um, and make sure you have the date of the event on there. Those things help us make sure that we're applying the points to the correct event date. Sometimes there's clubs with the same names in different states, and they may even have the same date. Yeah. And that stuff can get a little tricky sometimes. Yeah. And that's when uh, you can have some issues on the back end. So make sure that stuff's correct. Uh, make sure that the officials filled it out with their name, their contact information, and their signature is very important. That way that they sign off on the report being correct. Yep. Uh, make sure that the correct uh, boxes are checked and the correct columns are filled out. Um, you know, we've gone to a new form of reports in the past uh, four or five years where it's kind of one sheet instead of a whole booklet of sheets. And it's made the process a lot easier, but you still have to make sure that you're checking the right boxes in that situation, whether what category they're hunting in, what category they're showing in, what wins did they get there. When you're talking category, that means registered knight or champion or grand champion. Right. Uh, yeah, just make sure you're checking those correct boxes. And then in the registered portion of the show, make sure puppy, junior, senior, make sure you know that thing. That All that stuff should be on their entry forms. Yeah. And that's probably in the bench show reports. We see a lot of that where mistakes are made where they did not mark what class the dog was in, you know, and things like that. They might have the name down and this and that, you know, but that's – we weren't there. We don't know who won what, you know, and that's not just that. We Most of those are, uh, these are official records, you know, that we uh, put on file and everything. Uh, and that, uh, you know, the integrity of our degrees and all that is, uh, that's a big thing for UKC. Absolutely. So we re require the, the event officials, we need to sign documentation from them, you know, so Sometimes it's uh, it takes a little more than just a phone call to fix something like this. So it's always better to take another look over the report, make sure everything's there before you send it off. That's right. Entry breakdowns and uh, and numbers are a big thing. They say this is uh, in, having the entry no, uh, breakdown in numbers is actually the most common mistake that they see that hold up reports. That they don't have, they might have the total number of entries for everything, but don't have down how many registered, how many champs, and how many grands there were. You're, right. That's right. And especially in the bench show where it's so important when we get to talking about top 10 standings yep. or we're talking about competition yep. requirements for dogs in the show. That stuff is essential to getting those. Yeah. Uh, it, without it, we can't process that report if we don't have the correct breakdown of right. entries. Right. We have to have the number of entries in each category before we can finish, put any process, anything into the yeah. system. It's not like we can process it and put the wins on and do that later. Uh, that just, that report, if we don't have that, it goes into the problem basket until yeah. that's resolved. And there again, you have your customers or your participants uh, waiting on their degrees. Yeah. And I, I think one thing that we're seeing more off, uh, often is competitors or participants in the event. If you get a win at the hunt or the show, you're you're uh, going to wait to see that uh, event report. And even though we have win slips now, they're still taking a picture of that report. That way they have a full yeah. outline of what their right. win was and they keep it in for their records just, right. just in case something were to pop up. And if you're doing that, just hey, double check them. Uh, it's, the more eyes that see it and are uh, – making sure that everything's filled out correctly, the better. So hold mm -hmm. each other accountable on that. Yeah. Uh, one other thing we want to talk about is take your time putting down the winner's dog and owner information. Um, sometimes we'll get a, a kind of a skewed uh, UKC number where we can't tell it, or there may be uh, the numbers may be transposed a little bit and that, that's fine. We often catch those mistakes, but in that case, you have to make sure that you have the correct owner information and the correct dog name and maybe more than just their call name, especially if it doesn't match what their papers say, that way that we can actually double check that and make sure that we're applying wins to the correct dogs. Right. Don't need to have the dog's titles on the on the paperwork, you know, but just uh, instead of just Sam, you know, put down Gingrich's stylish Sam if that's the dog's name, you know. So Right. All that stuff comes in handy whenever we're uh, processing paperwork. And the last thing is making sure to get, make sure at the bottom of the page, and this is important if you're sending in uh, your uh, reports by email, make sure that you can see the whole sheet of paper 
if you're scanning that in. Uh, that way we can see the scratch for uh, fighting boxes down there to make sure that any dogs that do get scratch for fighting get the uh, get the correct uh, notch against them that, that they're supposed to get. Yeah. Uh, the next step would be uh, to use the event fee worksheet and figure out the money that you owe for the event. Getting money in with a report is uh, essential as well, and it'll keep you from getting bugged by our department with a bunch of letters after the fact. Um, and the event fee worksheet makes it really simple. It's a step-by-step -step process that kind of breaks it down all the way through. It tells you about uh, check this box for license fees for hunt, show, field trial, water race. Here's your recording fee. Are there any conditional entries? Panel appeal fees down here. And then you can add it up, get the total uh, total amount that's due for the event. And it makes it really simple for yeah. you. And then uh, uh, last thing there, filling out uh, event-specific paperwork. And really, there's nothing there I'm thinking of besides maybe an RQE, which is also, also, also that's a, a kind of an event fee worksheet type style where you fill out the money needed, but it's a little bit different than a regular event. And then also the Spotlight Series form. We're seeing a lot of issues with Spotlight Series forms not being filled out at all in an event. Any youth event at all, doesn't matter if it's a youth championship, state uh, state youth championship, breed championship, or just a standard YEP event, we have to have a spotlight series filled out. Um, that's imperative for applying those uh, point totals to the youth's records. You know, and I know uh, you may have a bullet point, you know, that this can, all this can sound uh, tedious, you know, but honestly, it doesn't take a ton of effort, you know, and, you're, and you can save a lot of headaches for the club. Uh, the event officials and the participants on the back end if you make sure your paperwork is filled out correctly before you submit it. Yeah. And then the last thing I would tell anybody who's newly into to running the club is to familiarize, familiarize yourself with the rule book. Uh, there's a lot of rules and procedures in there. They can step they can take you through step by step on how to run an event. And you should be kind of uh, you should you should know the ins and outs of that yeah. before you ever take charge and, and run events. You know, one thing I'd like to plug in there, I think it's just kind of human nature. If somebody doesn't know something for sure Oftentimes, uh, they just want to ask somebody or call somebody. Uh, what I would suggest is look at your rule book. Yeah. If, you, if you are a hunter, uh, participate in our events and don't have a rule book, you definitely should have one. Yeah. And then read that thing. Yeah. Read it. Yeah, if you look in there, there's a, there's a whole section for if you're a bench show judge, here's what you do, step yeah. by step. If you're a master of hounds or a hunt director, step by step, here's yep. what you do. Uh, it, just to every detail that you would need. It's a great resource for people and you need to be, you need to be really familiar with it. And it's imperative if you're going to put on successful events to be familiar with that area. Right. It's going to keep you from yep. a lot of troubles on the back end for sure. Yeah. And you talked about emailing, uh, hunt reports and things like that. You know, the, the best, it's an easy email to, re to remember hunting ops at ukcdogs.com. That's a good email to uh, send all those, to email any reports like that. And that's also a good email if you have any questions about any procedures for uh, putting on events or maybe for judges. If you have uh, rules, questions that you can't sort out with uh, with uh, using your rule book or the advisor column or maybe listening to this podcast, and you can always feel free to email us or give us a call there within the department. We'll help you out the best we can. For sure. You know, that somebody has a question for you specifically. They might not know your email address for sure. They can always use that hunting ops uh, at ukcdogs.com email and uh, it will come to you. If it's a question for you, it'll be, they'll forward it to you. Yeah. So we sure or hope me or whoever. I think that's kind of a wrap on kind of uh, new people into the, into the sport. I hope you guys have kind of enjoyed this two part series where we kind of went through this stuff. And I think it's a lot of good information. For sure. And last thing for me, you know, just uh, of some final thoughts on it, you know, uh, we all start somewhere, uh, learn these things and uh, know that uh, we need you. And we appreciate you and we appreciate the effort you put in uh, learning uh, everything you need to learn about it. And then you're a, a valuable asset to the sport if you can contribute in that manner. Thanks for listening to the UKC Hunting Ops podcast. Be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and to like and follow UKC Hunting Ops on Facebook and Instagram.